Awesome. So without a long introduction of why I'm speaking right now, um, and my throat is hurting a little bit, so my voice is a little bit like like this, but I'm Tess and I um, I wanted to record a podcast for a while, but I haven't done it because I've been, you know, thinking too much and not knowing what to talk about. And then I had the idea that I wanted to talk with you, Sarah, and I asked you and you were keen too. So now we're here and yeah, you have been just releasing a book, That's right? right. Um, and it's called Poetry Inside Out Understanding Non-Duality. No, Quintense, Quintessence. Can you pronounce that? Because I cannot pronounce it. It's called Quintessence, The Poetry of True Nature. Yeah. So it's basically poems that you have written that are pointing towards what? <laughs> to, just towards the essence of us, to, to who we are when that thinking gets stripped away to who we are when there's no beliefs of who we are and to who we are when we do believe we're we're something separate something something small something limited as well mm. so the the it should speak to people wherever they are yeah and what like do you have I know a lot of people that I've talked to, they have like a pinnacle moment where they're like, I saw it. I saw what we truly are and it changed my life. Did you have one of those moments or was it like, what's your story into writing this book, basically? You know what? I think if you could call it a pinnacle moment, all I really saw was that we all see this all the time. We literally, it's, it's not in the huge things. It's not those sort of mountaintop moments. It's actually, it's so subtle. It's like at the end of every in-breath where your body is just at rest for a second. It's when you're washing up and you just drift away and daydreaming or you're driving and you don't notice that you're driving anymore and suddenly you're 10 miles further and, and you know you've crossed a couple of dual carriageways and some big roundabouts and you've got no memory of them. It's when you fall in love, when you hold a baby for the first time. It's the tiny things and the big things. But what happens is the second we, the second they're experienced, we kind of claim them for the thing that looks like it caused it, for the activity, for the person, for the experience. And we actually lose the fact that what really happened is we lost the world, we lost the body, we lost the mind, we lost every idea, every thought of ourselves, and we came home totally to who we are. Mm. And the first thing ego does is is sort of say, oh, I did that, I did that. It was that person, and now you need that person to be happy. It was that activity, it was that meditation. Now you have to use that meditation every day to be happy, to be okay. And it's... The biggest realization for me was, no, it's not in the big, big, big one-off thing. This is here all the time. And it's it's as simple as turning around. It's as simple as noticing you're looking at a shadow and realizing that means the sun's behind you. It's, mm. it's permanently available because it's who we are at our essence. It's who we are when nothing else is there. So... There's loads of experiences, but they're all kind of personal and nobody else is going to have those same experiences there. And most of them, you know, they're, they're actually what I could tell you would be the story that got written afterwards, not not really the experience of of just the essence of us, because that, that doesn't really take words, mm -hmm. which is why poetry is maybe slightly easier than writing a, a teaching book. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting because I've previous or earlier I've been writing a lot. I don't do that as much anymore, and I've been just trying to write about the insights I have or the feeling that comes with just like when there's nothing else in the way that you talked about. And but it's like it can never really explain it because it's so non-wordable yeah. <laughs> you know it's so so i think poetry 
poetry, as you say, could be like a step closer, I guess. I never tapped into poetry myself, but I like what you write and I've been following your Facebook updates with your poetry and stuff and it's really nice. Um, so yeah. So what, what other things do you use as, the, I don't want to call them tools, but I'm going to call them tools because I don't have a better word to like, because you, you share this to people. Yes. Yes. So what kind of things do you do with them? Like what, what is it that you, is it just conversation or is it um, your poetry, obviously? What is it that you, how do you work with someone that is struggling? Where are you trying to take them? And you're right that I do use the poetry sometimes, partly because it, it doesn't actually feel that much like mine. So when I read the poems, I'm like, oh, wow, this is quite good. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I'm feeling proud of myself. It's like almost where did that come from? And the answer is I know, you know, I know where it came from. It was, as I say to people all the time, like less me, more wisdom. Mm -hmm. And things get written when there's less me in the way, when there's less idea of me trying to write. I could sit and try to write for days and then suddenly I'm walking somewhere and it's now I, I know exactly what I'm going to write. Or in fact, all I know is the title or one line and somehow the whole thing gets written. But the advantage I've got is that I know that when somebody's struggling, the root cause is they forgotten who they are mm. so for me the only thing I ever have to do is remind people who they are and a beautiful metaphor I was given was simply that if your friend was an actor you know they were playing Romeo and Juliet and after the play and you complimented them on how well they'd done they were still talking about the character's story like it were their own so you know, they were talking about their lost love, about they didn't know what to do, they no no solutions. They thought that the only way out was to die. You wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to fix the story. You'd want to remind them who they really are, not the character they're playing. So everything I do is pointed towards just reminding people who they are, establishing that for them as something that's real and not a. a and a one-off experience that they can talk about as something that happened that one time, but something that, that sort of comes from the background to the foreground of life. So some of the things I do are very, I'd say almost practical explorations of awareness because all the bells and whistles of the world, we tend to overlook the, the essence of it, which is the knowing of it. So I do spend time with people actually just so talking through well, what what is there that we know without without the colours and lights and sizes and all the the stories of the world. It's been incredibly helpful uh, for me as well, and just um, remembering that it's not the thoughts about myself that are, are necessarily true, or the things that I believe are true, they might, like, it's just concepts. And what is a concept? It's just a thought, right? And it's just, when I, yesterday I had a, a moment where it just like, I realized that I've been walking around with glasses of insecurity about a lot of things. Like just, if I have glasses of insecurity on, then everything basically has an insecure kind of filter on it. And then when that fell away, it was like, oh my God. And I, and I was like, I even like opened my eyes a little bit to try to like get get it all in, I guess. I don't know. Um, but it's just what happens when we see what we really are, you know, when we see that yeah. we're not the insecure things or you know. I mean, yeah, it's really it's really helpful. But it's so it's kind of like it's too good to be true in us in a sense. I think our ego is like, no, we 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 are uh, this body and we are this thing because the other thing is just no, we are we are so smart, so we are trying to like hold on to yeah, I don't know concepts, I guess. Yeah, we try to make it more complicated than it is all the time, <laughs> and you're right. It's like that one thought that who I am is limited to this mind and body puts insecurity glasses on and so mm. the insecurity isn't telling you anything other than momentarily you got caught up 
in believing you're the mind and body. Um, and that that's normal. I'm we're all going to go in and out of that, I think. But mm. but recognizing it that the insecurity doesn't need investigating for the situation or for the thought that might be causing it, but but simply that when we're identifying with that mind and body, when we're taking on those limitations, well, it is insecure. Mm. It That body has a beginning and an end, and it has so many things that can go wrong with it. There's so many things that can go right with it, but so many things that can go wrong with it. And the single biggest thing is it's that limitation, that contraction temporarily creates that apparent veil of all the things that awareness is of who we are without that limitation. Mm -hmm. So you're right. You're right when you believe you're the mind and body to feel insecure. It's actually, we tend to think the people in our society who feel that insecurity or anxiety are wrong they're right and then we just need to tell them why we need to Mm. tell them you've noticed something really really important and this is what it is rather than a million and one techniques for not feeling anxious i went to a conference with some school kids and they gave them a list of things to do if they felt anxious there were 110 (laughs) things to do If I hadn't been anxious at the beginning of the list, I probably would have been by the end of it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, we went, reminds me of this seminar about, uh, we went to an event here in Bali about stress and anxiety. And, you know, when you feel stressed, it might occur like this or this or this, and then you have, you can do all these different things and you need to try all the different things and find out what's the best thing for you to do when you feel stressed. And I walked out of there and I was stressed. I was like, (laughs) You know, and it was even a girl, and she said, um, "I know I should, um, I know I should write a journal every day, but I don't. But I'm okay. But I just know I should, and I feel stressed about it. It's like, well, if you're okay and you don't, you know, you don't have to write a journal every day, then I guess." <laughs> But she was like, "Yeah, you can, you know, keep it in the side of your bed and make sure that you just do it, you know, and and." It's just very interesting um, to me that it was so, like the moments when I have the most clarity of everything is when I have the le- the less like, I don't know, fixable things, you know, I need to fix this or I need to think like this next time this happens or whenever I'm stressed, I need to do this. And when I just stop believing in all of the, those things, I was just stressed and then it's like, it goes away and it's just so natural. It's just so natural. And like you said too, it's okay. Like it's not, it's nothing wrong with experiencing feelings of anxiety or stress or insecurity. And I used to think that I was, I was wrong. My ego was completely wrong and I needed to fix myself without even knowing what myself truly is. So that's kind of like, okay, good luck with that, Tess. Um, exactly. <laughs> it's like you're, you're trying to fix something that doesn't exist and yeah. you're never going to win. You're never yeah. going to win at that. Um, but I think it's just that like that self-help industry just got its back to front with the best will of wanting to make people feel better. They looked at what people who felt better, who felt peaceful, who felt calm, who demonstrated resilience did and they kind of wrote those down as things you should do when you feel bad to get to feeling good and they didn't realize those things were expressions of true nature expressions of peace and happiness and joy not ways of getting there Mm. so the way of getting from feeling terrible to feeling peaceful is whatever shows up Mm -hmm. and mostly one of the best little tools I have is that whenever I'm unhappy with the world it's because I want it to be different because I want me to be different my body to be different somebody else to be different Mm -hmm. and the question that comes to me is could I live with this for the rest of my life 
And for as long as I think I'm a, a separate little human being limited to a mind and body, the answer is always no. But eventually that fight has to give out because it, it's got no sustainability. And when I know I can live with something for the rest of my life, it's not a matter of I'll be okay when anymore. Mm -hmm. It's I don't need it to change to be okay. I don't need this person to be a particular way for me to be okay or for me to be okay with them. And that that changes everything because the insecurity can carry on doing its thing. Mm -hmm. If insecurity were my guide, I'd never have written a book because at every point in that publishing process, which takes about nine months with the publisher, mm -hmm. I, I could have backed out any time. And even now, it it's still kind of strange the idea that somebody's reading something I wrote that's been printed and posted to them and they paid money for that, that all feels strange. And I've just noticed the insecurity can just carry on. It's allowed. Sometimes I'll act out on it. Most of the time, it's just what's going on in the background. And it gets less because it, it's, like, um, it's like a weed without roots. It's not so much anchored into my identity. So it it just doesn't matter as much. Mm. And the peacefulness that was always there, but just covered over is just more, more apparent, mm. more in the foreground. And when there's nothing that really needs dealing with, it's just sort of the natural state. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah so I, I feel it. I feel what you're saying. And I, you know, what can I say? I agree. <laughs> I felt it too, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... It's just so... Sometimes I just see it in one picture or, or sentence, maybe. It's just like when there's nothing in the way, like it all appears, you know, all of it, the whole truth. Um, and then things come in the way, and I, the more I, I see what that is and when it's happening, like in the actual moments when I feel angry with someone or, you know, all these things, everyday things, the more I see what, what happens in those moments, it's just, uh, I don't know, easier to breathe through it, you know? Just not do anything except just be in it and breathe. And then when you see it fall away, you're like, yes. Then you really see it again, you know. <laughs> so it's like this. It's like this every day, in and out. But it's 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 amazing. It's really cool. <laughs> and it brings me, yeah. I was going to say we've been narrating our lives, you know, since we were two years old. You you only have to see a toddler, and they they can they spend the whole time sort of just talking away to themselves about what they're doing just in very basic language so the first thing that happens is that the mind will kind of jump in and try to create the narrative or the story for for the experience of of being without objects of being without limitations and there is that kind of dance in and out of it just as the mind maybe tries less and less to describe it to make sense of it to to own it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. My ego has had a difficult time sometimes <laughs> trying to understand non duality. Like now, for me, it's everything that we just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to just hear you talk a little bit about it because it's been something that I talked to you a little bit about and you've been working with Garrett Kramer um, in, his, in his work and I don't know, I've been, maybe you can explain it better, I've been just this thing maybe, I don't know, it's something there that makes me interested to hear your, like, your thoughts around it. Yeah, yeah and it there's so many people using the word in so many different ways, and it, it is, you know, in, in terms of spiritual traditions, it's one of the most ancient. But it just means not to. 
Yeah. It means that mind and matter aren't separate, that it's not that the world is creating how we feel or that how we think is creating the world. We don't need to get worried about if it's inside out or outside in. There's no separation between mind and matter. There's no separation between you and me. There's no separation between you and God, by whichever name you'd call God, mm. awareness, existence, life, essence, true nature. There's just no separation. And that the beauty of that is that then there's one ultimate reality. And all any kind of journeying is towards that one ultimate reality, which a lot of people call home, because it's mm. got that you know, taking off the, the city clothes and relaxing kind of feel to it. And once we've found that ultimate reality, anything that looks like it's outside of it, we just need to investigate why that's a misunderstanding and bring it in. So... You'll find it, and it happens in some religions as well, that as people understand they're not the mind and body, which which kind of makes sense, and we we can dissect the body in a, a living experiment without hurting it, and we were not going to find the me anywhere in the body. We'll find the symptoms of me, the signs of me, but we won't find the me in the body. So once we know we're not the body, and once we know that the mind, we're not the mind it can be quite common to sort of develop this sort of watcher or observer that, that somehow there's this body on a planet doing its thing and we're a bit distant from it. And so people get that sort of worry about being detached or ineffective or passive in life or not enjoying it, or not engaging. Mm. But once we know there's one reality, not two, it's impossible for there to be a watcher over here and down there, the mind and body kind of, organic robot doing its thing so non-duality demands really that you reclaim the body into awareness and you start to notice that the body isn't one continuous thing but actually it's awareness that remains and the body appears and disappears just as the world appears and disappears in awareness and once we start to reclaim the body to understand it as an expression of awareness made of awareness in awareness that's the true freedom nothing outside of awareness and to start with that can sound like a, a huge claim but most people just simply with their eyes shut can get a sense that who they are the knowing that they have is unlimited in time and space and the minute that knowing is unlimited in time and space in your understanding, there can only be one, there can't be an outside, there's no lack or limit or need or division. And everything else kind of just follows. That, that, that is the true simple logic. And it, it's just a lifetime of, of clearing up those long-held unspoken unworded beliefs you know the, the worded beliefs with a mind they get cleaned up quite quick but the the deeply held deep-seated beliefs that show up as the body that there's a lifetime there of of cleaning and releasing and you've got being young not 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 childlike but young you've got this massive advantage that you you've followed the natural progression you're You've developed properly, you've developed a sense of self and you've immediately stepped into the, the continuing development. You've not had that 20, 30, 40 years some people have of, of solidifying its separate self. Mm. And I think that that's the biggest hope for, for the people in the late 20s, 30s, that the more this becomes just a natural part of our development the less suffering there is, the, the less getting lost in separation there is, the more exploration of what true nature is happens. Mm. Getting lost in separation. 
Yeah, we do that all the time. We get lost in the idea that... So we'll, everything will be beautiful. You'll be out in nature. You'll be having a walk on a beach and everything's gorgeous and it's easy to kind of, you know, just that feeling, oh, I'm this, this is me, everything's one, it's all perfect. Mm. But the minute you get into a conversation with somebody or something that triggers you know, one of your conditioned beliefs, something that you don't even really know is there, and suddenly there's two of you, suddenly yeah. you're set. As that means there's there's somebody to fight against, somebody somebody to protect, somebody to defend, somebody to promote, somebody to develop, somebody to support, help. And that somebody doesn't exist, which is what makes it the the endless battle to try to to promote, develop, support, and defend that person. But that's what I mean about getting lost in separation. Anything that makes two. Like everything in the world is perfect, and you'll hear people say something like, "Oh, I totally get the woman, <coughs> but that person should be different. Mm. This situation should be different. Everything in life would be great if I just had that much money, or this mm. health thing happened." There's always a "I'll be happy when," which is is ego, not my ego, just ego, ego. The thought I am a separate person claiming. Mm. claiming the situation claiming the experience and trying to make that experience stand apart from awareness mm. and that that's the getting lost in separation which also comes it comes back to what you said earlier about the the suffering is it's just uh, not being okay with what is needing mm. to to change something or i'll be ha like you said well, i'll be happy when i have this and this or when i look like this or all of those things is just uh not accepting what is you know so that has been huge for me just understanding where my suffering <sighs> both appears but also how it shows up to me you know and like I talked to before also about the glasses that I had on, insecurity glasses, or you can have angry glasses on, and it's just like, there, it's impossible to have those glasses on if you are everything else, <laughs> in a sense. So it's really helpful to just kind of see in this direction and but, but I've been, both myself and people I've talked to have been like, well, okay, that sounds good. And they're trying to intellectually understand what you're saying. And they're trying to figure it out so that they will um, understand non-duality so that they will not suffer in the separation. And it's just like, it's, it's counterproductive, but it's also very, I think our logical brain works in that way. We, like the ego wants to understand uh, using the words that we know and so on and I don't know if you have anything to say about like that that we are trying I usually say well you're in search mode right now you're tr you're searching for answers and the, the answers are not in the search mode um, but how are we how can we get out of that search mode <laughs> of constantly searching yeah. for that the truth yeah, you're, you're exactly right. That it, it looks like, oh, brilliant. Here, here's a new way to feel better. Mm -hmm. Here's something. I'll just, I'll do it. I'll apply it, and I'll feel better. And yeah, it, it, it just so doesn't work like that. But the the escape clause in it simply is, we are not that mind. So then making that mind feel better just becomes so much less important. The, when we're suffering, we're, we've been taught this all our lives, when we're struggling physically or mentally or emotionally, we've kind of been taught to make ourselves feel better. You know, the first time a, a kid falls over, they, you know, it, they, everybody fusses around them and make sure they stop crying so when when bad things happen everybody wants you to feel okay if somebody dies every, everybody wants you to be okay 
nobody wants you to to suffer, to struggle, to to cry, to be sad. And so the those normal emotions like anger and sadness and grief have kind of been suppressed a lot in us. Even just um, commitment or dedication, passion. So that studying has always been divided into tiny little blocks with lots of treats in between it to, to make it okay. And all of those, we're, we're trying to... We're, we've always tried to make this separate person feel better and at a certain point all those techniques that we've learned all our lives about how to make ourselves feel better they kind of let us down they might last for years they might last for five minutes but at a certain point whatever it is that we've been doing to feel better to drink drugs exercise eating or not eating uh, meditating, watching spiritual videos, reading books, doing any of those things that we've we've come up with as ways of feeling better. At a certain point, they let us down. It might be at the very end of our lives, or we might be lucky enough to, to reach that point of realisation much younger. But in the realisation, in the full realisation, that's not who I am. It simply no longer makes sense to try to make that illusory person feel better any more than it would make sense to make the actor feel better about the story of their character. Mm. It just stops making sense. And the mind not being constantly fed that need, not no longer being driven by the ego, it's natural that thought begins to rise up because that's all the mind is. The mind's just a stream of thought. That's why we can't find it, localised mm. it. It just makes sense for those thoughts to start arising on behalf of who we know ourselves to be. So when we believe ourselves to be a separate person, thought arises on behalf of that separate person. When we know ourselves as awareness, as essence, thought naturally arises are more aligned, more on behalf of that awareness, of that essence. And that, that can sound incredibly harsh, but it it's the only answer. Yeah. yeah. It can sound harsh maybe to some, I don't know, but also how easy then, <laughs> how uncomplicated it all is. How can how can it be any easier, you know? To me, that 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 tells me just to like be in the being. There's nothing else. Like period. <laughs> There's nothing else. Just being in that being. Yeah. You know is and I, I'm sure I'm gonna. I'm not sure, but I think that I might have feelings of stress again, <laughs> and uh, and all these like I'm still gonna believe some of the concepts that I've created, but deeper down I have found um, I call it my guardian angel sometimes, or just a soft pillow bed that I can fall. I know I'm gonna fall back into it at any time. Um, because I've experienced that before and I know that everything that's in the way when it comes to thoughts is just feeding something that is not like it's real to me in the moment but it's not real in the sense that we've been talking about which to me has been very confusing. How can I experience myself as this body? How can I experience my thinking? How can I experience all of these stressful things? Or how can I truly believe that 
um, another person is making me upset or how can I still have that when I once had a glimpse of my true self yeah. you know well but it's yeah you'll still watch a movie and allow yourself to be lost in the story of it now, if it's a thriller, you'll you'll get lost in the fear. You'll you'll scream at certain points. If it's a a drama with a sad ending, you'll cry, and you'll willingly believe the story. You'll willingly believe the story has a has an existence beyond the screen. Mm. And when the movie's over, that screen, like you've got in the background behind you, is, is still the screen. So. There's nothing illogical or doing it wrong to to be in the story, to be there'll always be a story. But the story with the knowing that the screen is still there, that the screen hasn't gone anywhere, that the screen that the movie's playing out on is is always present, is the mm. only way the story can actually be known. And the same way that I'm looking at your picture on my screen now. There's no, I can't reach my finger out and find the edge of you. I can't find where your nose is or your shoulder is. I can't reach further into the screen and, and find the wall behind you. It's all, it's all made of the one thing. And when I'm not talking to you anymore, when I'm working on a piece of writing, the same screen, the exact same pixels will be, will be the words that I'm writing. There won't be any difference. The screen is completely present in in this conversation. It, the screen is completely present in the, the writing. The screen is completely present if I play a game, card game on the computer. And in each mm. of them, there's lots of apparent lines of separation. There's you, there's Morton, there's the TV, there's a window, there's a wall. But none of them are real from the point of view of the screen from the point of view of the screen the screen is just how those images are known mm. and i don't think we need to be look we're not looking for some mountaintop zen experience again we're not looking to be to be blank and vacant we're not looking for there to be no story we're just looking to know where the story's playing out mm. so that we can lose ourselves in it and find ourselves again over and over and over and it, a lot of people say to me oh well this non-duality thing's great and maybe when I'm old or you know when I'm dead <laughs> that's when this is for because <laughs> now I've life to live and that's ego again, just claiming, claiming the peace, the joy, the happiness, the freedom, the abundance, the wisdom of true nature for itself. Mm. And people I know who, who live more and more as expressions of true nature, they're, the, they're doing stuff in the world. They're effective because there's nothing holding them back there's no filter and insecurity doesn't matter so they're the people who will change the world will bring peace because they come they appear as peace in the world mm. as an expression of peace and because that's who we all are that that speaks mm. even if they're they don't even know what they're teaching and they they kind of get it a little bit mudded up with other people in relationship. You'll hear it over and over again. You'll hear it in movies. You'll hear it in speeches of people like Barack Obama and going back in history, people like Martin Luther King and Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear it in religious writings, Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha. You'll start, you start to see it everywhere, just this simple expression and I think the one advantage we have in this age is that we can be a bit more explicit we don't need to dress it up or hide it as much we can actually just bring it to the fore and so when I work with people 
I, you know, I, I feel for them when they're suffering and I listen to the stories, but there's no value at all in me diving into that story as well, in trying to make the story better. There's so much value in me doing what my teacher did for me, which is love, support and a resolute point within. Mm. That that calls people home, that gives people a chance to, for themselves to, to recognise that there's never a distance to travel, that however dark a situation seems, the light by which it's known is knowing awareness. It's We can't travel away from awareness, we can't take a step away from ourselves. <coughs> it's right where we are. Mm. That really speaks to me because I've been, when I first started exploring um, this whole thing that we're talking about, um, I was scared that I was going to become this hippie sitting in the jungle meditating all day and not meeting people because I wouldn't need to meet anyone right I would feel this connection to everything all the time so I wouldn't uh, have fun and laugh um, because I thought that if, if I get lightened enough I would understand that the things I see outside of me is me and I wouldn't enjoy them as much for example I had all these crazy thoughts about it but then what I've noticed is just what you're saying when there's nothing in the way we seem to, I mean, go with the flow is a common expression, but I realized, especially here in Bali, just I let go of a lot of ideas and things and insecurities, and I've seen what the true, like, what is really going on. And therefore, I've been able to, like, choose my um, tasks easier, what to do. I've been... Um, you know, eating great food and enjoying it more. I've been meeting people way more easily and just like find the connection there. I've been doing a lot of things and I've been doing not a lot of things, but the more I realize that it's not in the things that I do, the more I can explore the things that I do because I'm not scared of it, you know. Um, so that has been huge for me, just the fact that, okay, it's not about, you know, it's just a, a, a <laughs> like a, I don't know how to describe it really, but it's just a, a happening of experience that is being shown to me with my, I don't know, senses, I guess, and my consciousness or the consciousness also. Um, and therefore it's not, nothing out here is dangerous. Not even dying is dangerous anymore because I'm eternal. Like the screen that you talked about is eternal, right? It can never disappear, it can never go away. And it's always been there. Yeah, um, exactly. There's yeah. never been a single experience that you've had outside of awareness. And that sounds so obvious. It goes <laughs> it, it's quiet, it's ordinary. It, it's just, it's so much who we are that ego will say oh is that it no there must be more to it than that yeah and yet that the as we become the expression of that knowing it does it shows up in for one person they may be quieter for another person they may be more active and that that doesn't matter but the with nothing filtering joy Joy gets to express itself in the world as you. Mm. It's not through you. You're not this separate being who somehow got allowed joy. It It's a coming home to that's who you are. Mm. Uh, you know, happiness is joy sometimes and peace other times. Just, And then when you realise that this isn't about being crazy and wild either, it's it's... It's a movement or a dance within awareness, a whirl of awareness taking on apparent form and dissolving back into itself within time, mm. telling a story, 
to itself. Mm-hmm. Nothing predestined, everything simply unfolding. And like you said, choices become easier because we start to realize there's not a chooser. Mm. Sure, there's a choice, but the the which choice becomes way more obvious, way more apparent. And that's because there's less of this separate person in the way. And somebody said it to me the other day that they, they'd got a really good intellectual understanding of things, but they wanted to embody it. Mm-hmm. And embody is a great word because it it that's where it takes the longest to clean out. So that that's where we really will feel it strongest when, when it's fully established. And I asked them for an example and said, oh, I I know that wisdom will always be available to me in the future when I need it, so I don't need to worry. But I, I just can't feel that. And I'm like, okay. So I said, so have you ever done really stupid things? And they said, yeah. I said, have you seen other people do exceptionally stupid things? You're like, murder somebody maybe. It's like, yeah, 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 I've seen that. And I said, and have you ever felt like, you know, in a situation where, you just didn't know which way to turn and they're like yeah and I said and do you think other people sometimes have just been felt completely at a loss completely unsupported and they're like yeah 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 I said so do you think the reason that you don't feel that wisdom will always be available to you is because that's not actually true mm. that fortifying this sense of you is actually taking you away like metaphorically turning you away from the wisdom that you are and that actually to explore that to explore who you are to explore that nature of wisdom and to explore this idea of you to find out well where is that idea of you outside of awareness that then you become the expression of wisdom Mm -hmm. and they immediately said I feel that Mm mm-hmm and that that's the beauty sometimes of, of speaking in slight metaphors or poetry or things that are a little bit mind-blowing. It's mm. almost deliberate. It's take you beyond the mind and for you to realise, ah, mind is blown and I'm still here. Mm-hmm. So I'm not that. And there's never any harm in, with the pain, with the struggle, with the insecurity or anxiety or suffering, to stay with it, to not do that culturally conditioned thing of distraction or cure or technique, but to to stay with it, to stay, as as I've been told, keeping your feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. Because we find right in the middle of the suffering, there's this idea that in the middle of that suffering is this person, this person who needs to be who's worth it. And what we find really in the middle of the suffering is is a space, is the knowing of it, is not the person. And so when we stay with the suffering, when we commit to living with it forever, mm. we, we find that the suffering is is without the meaning, without the story, without the idea I'm a separate person, becomes that dance, that flow of sensation and perception and feeling within awareness. Mm. We notice we've always been home. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. I remember one time I... I looked up at the stars and I just felt that home feeling, which I can describe as um, happiness or uh, abundance. But home is like closer, in a sense, in, in my my understanding of the word home, anyways. And 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 it was like in that the feeling of home was also a feeling of I'm gonna come home again. <laughs> so it's like gratitude towards that too because then it was like oh I can like you said I can have this dance and I can go in and out of feeling this understanding this trying to figure out anything and then stop trying to figure out and 
that's when I go home again, when I'm when I just stop to figure anything out and I just remember what I already know. You know, and there's no words to that to what I already know. There we 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 try and we, we put words on it, but really it's just what we know before our first thought when we wake up, right? Yes. In the morning. Or when we're newly born and we don't have, you know, I, I can't remember my first thoughts. I don't know. Before that, though, I'm pretty sure I was home and I'm always home. Yeah. And within that, the, there is emotion. There is sadness and even anger because love, love isn't passive. Love, love really takes a stand because love doesn't have a fear for itself it doesn't have a what will other people think of me mm. what it what if it all goes wrong what if this happens it, love doesn't have that so love will take a stand and that that can be an expression of anger and it you've seen it in you see it in stories in the bible of jesus going into the temple and throwing out the money lenders you see it in stories of other great teachers that there have been times where they they have shouted and screamed for peace as peace on behalf of peace and that is fundamentally different from protesting against something mm. it's not protesting against something it's uh, my my friend's nine-year-old just the other day said if you hate a hater then suddenly there's another hater in the world. That <laughs> mm -hmm. we're not standing against anything, we're simply standing knowingly as who we are, as awareness, which means as peace, joy, happiness, freedom, abundance, wisdom, resilience, standing as an expression of them, as them, in the world. And that's when things happen. That's when this story changes for the better. Mm. On a global sense, not in a a little person needing to feel needing to feel they're worth it. Because mm. that's the the single most crippling thing is is waiting till you're confident. Waiting till your self esteem is high enough. Instead, just understanding that any idea that we're not is simply an identification with an ac accidental identification that who we are is this mind and body. Hmm. It's limited to the, the fate and the capabilities of this mind and body. And as soon as we know we're not, that, that starts to infuse every thought, every activity of the mind and body. And the, the yeah. ego thought, the thought I'm a separate person, just arises less often. It has less power. It'll fight back, but over time it, it just has no roots. Mm. And it, it just becomes part of the whole story, part of the sensation, the perception, the feeling. And we live it. Mm. Yeah, I don't have anything more to say now <laughs> do you have anything more you want to say no no mm. it's, um, it's just it's a wonderful thing to see this message spreading to see it becoming the foundation of how people live and to see all the different directions that takes them in, like you guys traveling the world with your van and you know, my book arriving, these things that seem could look impossible, just happening. Yeah. And, and it, it seems to be a time of great opportunity mm. that more and more of us are noticing that the techniques and strategies we've been taught are letting people down mm. and that it is time for a completely new paradigm that doesn't 
fiddle around with trying to work out whether the world's making us feel this way or we're creating the world, but just looks utterly beyond that who we are. Mm. Yeah. I feel great. I've, uh, <laughs> it's been a joy. It's been fun. And just for our egos to have something to read, where can we find your book? Now is your time to like do a little bit of... <laughs> I don't know, promotion. <laughs> the book is on Amazon Global Marketplace, which means that I think outside of the UK and Europe, it means it gets printed in the States and shipped, but at local cost. So okay. it's um, Amazon.com, Amazon UK, and um, Amazon Global Marketplace is the best way. And it's literally printed and shipped mm. whenever it's ordered. It yeah. takes... I think within the US and the UK, it takes about 36 hours and further afield, it, it's simply delivery time. Yeah. And it's available on Kindle as well. Okay. Cool. I didn't know that's quick to print the book, 30, 36 yeah. hours. Wow. <laughs> right. If somebody orders it for within the UK, if it's ordered before 9 a.m., it's next day delivery. Wow. And it's a very eco-friendly method because there's no storage, no wastage. Yeah. And the system, the systems are just fantastic. I've learned a lot about publishing over the last nine months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mostly I've learned I'm really glad that somebody else did it for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good. It's good to know if you want to write a book in the future. Yeah. Um, and you have your website where people can contact you if they yeah. want to talk to My you? My website's called Living Life Sideways, and that has my blog and details of the book and events and webinars and everything else that's going on. Yeah. So what is the next uh, event that you're doing or retreat? Oh, we've got, it's two and a half weeks away now. We have a retreat in Scotland mm. uh, on the shore of the only lake in Scotland, everything else being a loch. Uh, it's a beautiful place somewhere I've been going to for a long time uh, family owned and run with changing sky and landscape and weather and a lake you can swim in and just a fantastic quiet peaceful place to to sit and to talk and to to swim in this conversation as well as in the lake and mm -hmm. we're really looking forward we're taking a small group away with us we're really looking forward to that we've got I think we've got one bedroom left and a couple of spaces for day guests at the moment so that that's the next event and then once that's done we'll we'll start planning for the future but I think another webinar series is probably coming up cool great thank you so much um yeah I feel thank you <laughs> Thanks, guys. I've really Thank enjoyed you. talking to you. Same. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. Is it anything else I should say now, mm. Mr. Podcast Guy? <laughs> you know, subscribe uh, and uh, share, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. All good. All good. Great okay. job. Approved. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to stop the recording.